I was 10, 11, 12, I don't remember, in line for the movies. And my, there were two guys in line in front of us, like three or four people in front of us holding hands. And my mother pulled me to her, not my siblings, just me, and looked at my father and said, they're weird. Which just made me look at those guys and I went, oh, now I get it. I'm weird like they're weird. And, and I looked at them and I thought, they look happy, they look like they're in love. Um, I'll be fine. Inform brings you incredible stories. I left two days before the revolution. It killed me so hard. James has never experienced the taste of fruits that haven't been attacked by pesticides, just like he's never experienced a neighborhood that hasn't been attacked by bullets. Some things just go hand in hand. People say what's on their mind. I think that it is a, um, a cardinal sin to lie to the American people um, about war. Partisanship is a version of narcissism. In downtown San Francisco, the Commonwealth Clubs and Forum curates events that bring you face to face with the world's changemakers. One third of the wage gains that women have made since the 1960s were made as a result of the birth control pill. Twitter is a technology that I don't think we've seen before in this world. Since 1903, the most innovative leaders have come to the Commonwealth Club to share their vision. Sharing cars, sharing their homes, sharing, sharing a shared dream, a shareable American dream. That could work. You each can play a role in helping us chart a better future. Housing and health and education and policy all live close to the surface in us when our children are murdered. It's all the same story. We bring together the visionaries shaping the emerging trends in technology. It was a combination of instant and telegram. It was the idea that you could take a moment in time and you could capture it and you could just send it out and broadcast it with the entire world. I just threw the site together in about a week when I was at school. Oh, great. We've got angels, we've got incubators, we've got accelerators, we've got seed funds, we've got crowdfunding. We eat. We drink. <laughs> One of our first dates ever, we pickled like 100 pounds of herring and made 300 Definitely pounds of nerds. sauerkraut. Wow. Yay! Yay! We never shy away. 75% of the people of this country want universal health care and expect it. And damn it, let's go. Concentrated, deep, slow, loving, tender, passionate sex. Whether you want to be on the cusp of current events or feast on pop culture. I should have a great time writing it. I should write a book that is as fun as any party I'd be skipping. Inform events are fun and action-packed. I have a sh an anthropology scarf that does that <laughs> twisty thing, so. Come feed your mind and soul and celebrate the future with Inform. I love San Francisco and every time I come back here I remember that this is the only city in America that has magic. Hello, and welcome to today's Inform virtual event. I am Jacqueline Martinez Garcel, CEO of the Latino Community Foundation. And I have the honor today of spending this next hour with a change maker, legendary Maria Hinojosa the 28-year-old host of NPR Latino USA, CEO of Futuro Media Group, a pioneer, trailblazer, fighter, social activist, someone who I deeply respect and admire. Hola, Maria. <laughs> Hola. I'm just multitasking. I'm just signing things. Oh, here it is. This. Yeah, My book no, is here. I want you to sign it. How are we going to make this happen? I'm going to have to go to Washington Heights to get you to sign no, it. No, 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 no. <laughs> There's a way, by the way. There's a way. Um, it's a, it's, you know, I guess people do this, but I have little stickers and I will sign it for you Aww. and send it to you. And then you can, bueno. and then when I see you the next time in person, then we can hug. All right. Well, I'll take that for now. <laughs> well, I have to say that when I got the email from Commonwealth, I actually did a triple take. I said to myself, she wants me to interview her. A hundred thoughts and questions rushed through my mind. Um, and then I got your book, Once I Was You, A Memoir of Love and Hate in Torn America. And I'm going to confess, I got the hard copy, but I also did the audio because you're an amazing storyteller and I wanted your voice to guide me through these pages. 
um, when I read through it, it just all came together. And I kind of understood why you would have wanted a Dominicana who was born in Washington Heights, who loves her culture, her family, who lives crossing boundaries every single day. Um, this book felt like a sancocho for me, honestly, Maria. Um, and I still, with all of that, I still couldn't sleep last night thinking that we were going to have this opportunity to be together. Um, first, of all, I just want to say thank you for writing this. Um, it's so powerful. Um, I would recommend this book for any beating heart that is wondering how we're going to turn this corner from this dark period of history right now. Um, it's when we read her story, not his story, her story, that we can understand how our story, um, our legacy, our generation is going to fit into this crazy upside down world we're living in right now. So let's get started. I actually want to start to the very beginning um, pages, um, not to the letter, which we'll talk about in a second, but to the moment that you were a baby in your mom's arms, um, she just come into Dallas, Texas. And here she is, this petite young woman, five feet tall, facing this man who you later describe as a hundred year old redwood because he was so tall. And it was in that moment that your mom, when she was threatened, the thought of you being taken away from her because you had a little rash on your skin that you'd just gotten because you had a blanket in the plane. They threatened that they would take you away from her. And that's when your mom, her voice just resounded. I want to hear from you. How did that moment, as you reflected on it, as you wrote about it, shaped your recognition um, of your own voice throughout your life? So the way, <clears throat> first of all, thank you. And thank you for all of those words. And the paintings behind me over there, those are made by Herman Perez. Dominican artist. Dominican um, artist, whom I love, yes. Yes, and, and he's been just an essential part of my life and, and really, you know, such, such um, a pillar of my life that allowed me to basically do this. So, um, so the arrival of my mother is, um, is an important part of the story, and I didn't really realize what was happening. I, I would often tell this story once I, once I got it, because I didn't get it until I was in my 30s. So part of what I hope happens with Once I Was You is that people actually start asking. And it's hard to get people to tell the arrival stories because some of them are really hard and there's some shame. And I realized that this is what happened with my mom. First time I heard the story, to make it short, it was like, nope, was, you know, we arrived. We all had our green cards. We were going to meet dad, who was at the University of Chicago in Chicago. And... Um, you know, this very tall immigration agent at the Dallas airport in, nine, in the early 1960s, you know, said that he was going to, you know, that you had the measles and that he was going to have to put you in quarantine. And, you know, I just, my mom is speaking and she's like, and I just stood up to him and I said, no, 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 you know. And so the way that I would tell this story was that my mom understood what it was to be an American even before she was an American. She had a green card and she was like, I know my rights, you know, I'm going to stand up and... And so I would tell the story. And if I was on stage with you at the Commonwealth, you know, I'd be like prancing around and telling the story about this little woman who stands up, you know, and that was, that was the applause moment in my speeches. It was like, oh, now I know where I get my voice, tiny but mighty, my mom. And then, um, you know, I've been reporting about children being taken from their parents for not just, you know, in the past 10 years, but before that. But certainly when we heard the audio of toddlers and four and five year olds, um, you know, screaming for their parents, it was a shocking moment for everybody. And so I was at the airport and my mom called and my mom was in tears. And she said, I said, mom, ma, que pasa, que pasa, ma? And then she just said, you know, I realized that it, that could have been me. And I was like, what are you talking to? And she was like, ma, she says, mamita, the women who have had their babies taken away from them, that could have been me. And those babies, that could have been, that could have been you. And everything, everything, I just went into a kind of a mini state of shock because then it all made sense. Um, I never realized that what was happening, to be honest with you, la verdad, la verdad, is that I was like, what a fluke this was that this Dallas immigration agent at the airport was gonna, what a total fluke. That guy was crazy. You know, well, no, actually, there was a policy of taking children 
and I'm going to use a slur now, so please understand. But as you you know, there is a very particular, sorry about the siren, we're in New York. Reminds me of Washington Heights, that's yeah, all. Yeah, it's in Harlem, we're Harlem, it's the middle of the day, so you know. Um, so there is a very particular slur, right, that is used for Mexicans. Um, and that slur, you know what it is, because you know that there are two words that go together for the slur. The words are dirty Mexican. By law in the state of Texas until the year 1964, you could actually search and check Mexicans to see if they were dirty. That's, that's what this led to. There was actually a campaign. It's complicated what happened in El Paso and all of this. But that's, that law was on the books in Texas until 1964. That's why that immigration agent was looking at me. That's why he was going to take me when I had a tiny little rash. And I wasn't just a fluke. You know, the next part of Once I Was You, if I had time, would have been to do um, the search, get the architectural uh, plans for the Dallas-Fort Worth airport in 1963, 62, and find out where was the room where they were gonna take me. And then you're like, oh wait, there was a room? So I wasn't the only one. And this is exactly what he said. He said, we're going to keep her. And that's when my mom, it wasn't, you know, the feminist, I'm an American, you know, with a green card and I'm going to speak. It was trauma. Mm -hmm. That's what my mom called to say. She said, I realized what it was, was I was in a state of panic. And that's why I started screaming. So the revelation of kind of, um, you know, this title of like, uh, you know, I could have, it could have been me. In other words, not so much that's not the important thing, but rather this has been going on for a long, long time, too long. And so Maria, take us to that moment. Um, you start your book with this beautiful letter that you write uh, to this little girl that you met at McCullen Airport. Um, that voice, that inner voice of that speaking to you wherever you go, um, then that turns into that louder voice where you speak out loud and you choose to speak in Spanish in that moment in particular. So they, those children can hear you. Talk us through what was going through your mind um, at that airport. So um, except for the pandemic, I'm a seasoned traveler, which means I know airports really well. I know, I, I, I mean, I've been to all 50 states. So I know airports and I know airport body language. So that morning at seven o'clock in the morning at the McAllen airport, um, I see a little girl. I'm actually on my knees trying to find a plug as usual. And um, I see this little, I kind of look up and I see a little girl, beautiful little girl with the most amazing skin and eyes. And, and um, I, I realize she's, she's not looking at me. She's looking through me. And also, you know, when kids, <clears throat> when kids are at airports, you know, kids are like this. Excited. <laughs> you know, they're just like, oh my God, we're at an airport and what's going and what are... And that's what caught my eye. And then when I, when I did the wide angle, you know, and I zoomed out and I was like, oh my God, she's one of these kids. Oh my God, I'm seeing this. It's happening. I had seen it before, but I, I hadn't realized. And that's the whole idea is that these children were, are being transported in the airports and it's happening in plain sight. It's kind of really sinister. Mm -hmm. So when I realized, oh my God, this is my moment, I went and I sat next to her and I've had like, a, not so much a journalist moment. It was really kind of like a mother moment because I felt like, oh my God, she hasn't seen her mom. And so I sat down so that nobody would kind of realize what was going on. And I just started talking to her very quietly. So because, you know, the so-called chaperones, I would say they are the traffickers, kidnappers. Call it what it is. I'm sorry. The definition of being trafficked is that you do not know who is taking you from place to place. Where you do not know where you're going. Mm -hmm. You do not have access to your documents. And you have been told not to speak to anyone. These children are being trafficked as per the definition of being trafficked. 
So, um, you know, the chaperones uh, would not let me speak to them. And that's what happens in the end is that I'm like, okay, well, I have to say something. They're not letting me speak to these children. I need, I need to say something to these children. And then I get into um, Voz Alta. I go, you know, in Spanish, I start basically talking to the chaperone, but I'm actually talking to the kids. And in Spanish, I'm saying, es que los niños tienen el derecho de saber que ellos pueden hablar con un periodista. These kids need to know that they can speak to a journalist, that they have that right. Ellos tienen que saber que los queremos. You know, we, we want them to know that they are loved. De que no les tenemos miedo, that we're not afraid of them. De que estamos, de, de que estamos al tanto, that there are people who are, who are on, on top of what's happening to them. And then I, you know, say to this little girl, you know, I wanted you to hear me because I see you and I see you because once I was you. And um, I just got to tell you, you know, people are really taken by this title, which is really beautiful. I've come to love it. I feel like it's really... It comes every time I hear you say it. <laughs> I, I really, I just, I came to love this title, but you need to know that was one of the most challenging parts of this book was when I was finished and finding a title. We could not come up with a title. Mm -hmm. It happens. You know, I was very sad. I was like, how is it? And my, my agent was like, don't worry. It's all going to fall into pieces. Don't worry. And I was like, yeah. And then finally we had another reader come in and that was the, they were like, there's your title. And I really, really love it. It's so beautiful, Maria. And it actually speaks to who you are as a person, as a journalist. It's seeing people, seeing them. And so much of this book is about seeing the humanity in all the worlds that you, tra you traverse. Um, from seeing that little girl um, to being in places where most people would overlook or look for a hidden story and what's right in your face is a story that needs to be told. It's just so beautiful to be seen written throughout this entire book. One of the things that stood out for me um, throughout it was how you crossed borders, both physical and emotional and class borders and race borders um, between Mexico, the US, Washington Heights and Midtown, Manhattan, um, having Juan Luis Guerra in your house with Scott Simon, like really, I took a moment, like I looked up to my husband, like really, really, <laughs> Juan Luis Guerra and Scott Simon in her house. But one of the things you said about that moment is that you love the fact that neither of them knew who they were. Um, and these worlds that you're a part of, that you go in and out, has kind of become a superpower for you. I mean, that's how I see it. It's grounded you so beautifully in who you are. In fact, your cousin, I says, called you La Colondrina. And, and that was a defining moment for you in realizing, right? Talk to me about that moment, that it all kind of came together, not needing to be defined by one world or the other, but all these worlds that you're a part of. Um, I love the fact that you love that moment in the book because it really did happen. Um, and I, I was like, I would have been there. That's all. <laughs> I was like, no, it's que la gente, you know, Juan Ruiz is a, Juan Ruiz is my, a, a friend of my husband's. My husband actually designed, um, Ojalá que llueva café. The album cover is my husband's design. Um, and so, yeah, Juan Ruiz was in town and they came up. Isidro Bobadilla, who is his percussionist actually is the reason why I met my husband because I knew Isidro. So yeah, everybody was hanging out at a super big party and I had invited Scott. I was like, come on up. And he came up and um, we had opened up the roof. And so it really, I just remember saying, this is like the jam. Like Scott Simon is here and a certain group of people at the party knew who he was. And they were like, oh my God, Scott. And then a whole other group of people knew who Juan Luis got, was. And they were like, oh my God. Um, so thank you for shouting out that moment. Um, yeah, I do think that you know, living in all of these multiple worlds helped me to understand that being a border crosser in multiple ways, like understanding that concept. And I, 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 love, I loved writing about growing up on the south side of Chicago at, near the University of Chicago, but it was a black community. And then every week we would drive, once we finally got a car, to Pilsen, 18th Street in Chicago, which is where the Barrio Mexicano was. And how my mom you know, would become, you know, this perfect Mexican woman in El Barrio, and she was speaking to everybody, si, sí, no sé qué, you know, coqueteando the whole, like seeing my mother in another place and then driving back to High Park and just like it was another, another world. I think this allowed me to not be afraid of the crossing back and forth, of the living in Washington Heights and working at CBS News. I did feel like especially as a journalist, it gave me a superpower because I was like, y'all don't even know what's happening uptown. 
Now, interestingly, what it meant as a journalist was that, yeah, it gave me real life experience for what communities were living through. But <clears throat> many times when I would try to, like I would come back, I remember when I was living on 106th Street, now I was married to Herman, we had, Raul was born, we lived on 106th Street, which was Crack Alley. It was, that was the name of 106th Street. And um, I called 911 because there was a shooting on the street corner. People were dealing drugs. I called 911 and I got a recording. Please hang up and try your call again. All circuits are busy. And I was like, what is going on? Like this happens in our communities, but other places you call 911 and an operator answered. And my editors, I remember my editors at NPR was like, yeah, that, that didn't happen. And I'm like, it happened. You know, this was kind of the gaslighting, right? Where we as people of color are experiencing, like right now we're experiencing a certain reality and our hair is on fire saying something is going on and we're being told, yeah, no, this is what we're living through right now. That's why, you know, the, the celebration of my book release last week and the continuing celebration and all the love that I'm feeling like from you, Jacqueline, about the book. Like, I'm just like, damn, I mean, I just wrote this thing, but it's like really so good. acting, you know? I'm just like, cause I, you know, I haven't done this in a long time, but the fact that the book would be released yeah. at the same time that the story is breaking about forced hysterectomies on women, um, I think is, is very telling about what I'm trying to say we have a problem in terms of immigration in this country and we know that, but the level of dehumanization, it's beyond alarming. I mean, I, I do hope that the Mexican government files an international human rights case against the United States government. I've been waiting, sadly, if you know Mexican politics, the leftist indigenous president of Mexico is, uh, I'm sorry, a collaborator of Donald Trump's. Very, 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 very disappointing. So I'm not sure if that will actually happen because of the geopolitics. And so once again, immigrants thrown under the bus hmm. by both parties, by both governments, it's just, it's, it's desperately sad. And naturally, it's funny you use those words. That was the, the segue to this next part of the conversation about this present moment. And um, your book felt so much like a warning, sounding alarm all over. You've been doing 1986, 1996, 2006, sounding the alarm, sounding the alarm. And here we are, and Latinos make up 59 million in our country, right? 32 million largest ethnic voting bloc in our country right? Second largest, largest ethnic. And here we are getting headlines about what's happening, not new to the United States, happened in Puerto Rico, happened to Mexican American women, sterilization, it's happened. M Maria, can it get any worse? Like what, if, and honestly, the thing, the other thing I tied to this question is we're about to have another debate, not the first debate for this presidential election. And I'm thinking Maria should have been the one moderating that debate, first of all. And if you were the one in front of those two candidates right now, because what you say in your book is so true, this is not a Republican or Democrat, like both of them have thrown us under the bus and they're all equally responsible. Like can yeah. it get worse? What, what would you say? What would you ask these two candidates? How would you? Um, oh, sweetie, let me tell you, let me tell you. Um, you know, what's sad to me is that it's, you know, less than two months to the election and um, neither Kamala Harris nor Joe Biden has agreed to speak with me. I don't understand that. I, it makes me very sad that they feel like they have to be afraid of me. I don't, I don't think that I'm a mean person. I don't think that I'm a scary person. Actually, if you listen to all of the interviews that I did with presidential candidates, they were, I mean, it, Bernie Sanders is not really soft and gushy. I made him get a little soft. Um, so I have, I don't understand why they're afraid of me. Latinos and Latinas, we have questions. And as the second largest voting bloc in this country, we deserve answers. And a politician that is afraid to speak to a journalist, I don't even understand that. I'm just like, I'm not gonna bite you. And you know what I'm going to ask you. So I would kind of hope that you already had thought about an answer. Um, it's very, I mean, four years ago during the 
presidential debates, I was complaining about this. I was saying, how is this possible? This man is running on an anti-Latino, anti-Mexican, anti-immigrant platform. He began his campaign using hate speech. We, why is it that we call it hate speech, but other people just call it his campaign? It's hate speech. So do I want to be in the same room as this person? I've been, actually. He sat behind me on Broadway uh, during a off broad no, it was on Broadway, Deaf Poetry Jam. Uh, Donald Trump sat behind me. He did he left an intermission and he left a bunch of hand wipes all on the floor right underneath him. So I think what's hard for us is really kind of watching this erasure happening as we speak. Yeah. Eso sí es como que you know, and here's what here's what I say to my colleagues. I don't understand, and this is like when people say, well, what can we do? What can we do? Um, you know, in this particular case, for example, I don't know. You know, my colleagues in the mainstream media could say, we're going to boycott. We are not going to participate in the presidential debates until you name a Latino or Latina anchor. Just one. And I was actually saying, why only just one? Right. You're Dominican, I'm Mexican, we have different experiences, you know, and yet Dominican and Mexican actually super important to have both of those perspectives, for example. Salvadoreño, for example, would be really good. So I feel like this erasure, I'm getting really angry about it because, you know, it's the basics of journalism, of accountability journalism, that a community that is being attacked have a chance to ask for accountability. And we as Latinos and Latinas are being denied that by the Presidential Debate Commission. Shame on them, right. shame on them. And by the way, it's like six people. It's not a big commission, it's six people. Listen, we wrote letters. Latino Community Foundation was writing a letter to them. We publicized it. We reached out to New York Times because it's embarrassing that at this moment in history, at this moment in history, like you said, 2016, defining moment for this current president, how he how he went out campaigning, and we're not going to have a moderator that's Latino to represent the second largest voting bloc in our country. Like it's just mind blowing. But it's we continue. But, but 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 you know the thing is is that we cannot be gaslit. So you did the right thing. So it's like ah, nos quieren silenciar, silenciar. Okay, well we're going to use our voice. It may feel like a drop in the bucket, but that is what we have to do. That is absolutely what we have to do. So Maria, some questions are coming in. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back and forth because one question that just came in relates to that. She's a young journalist. She's saying, what advice do you give us at this moment to continue? Um, it's hard time to continue to use our voice. Like, What advice would you give young journalists right now? My advice is please don't give up. Please read the book, News for, after you read, Once I Was You, please read the book, News for All the People by Juan Gonzalez. Um, and the reason why is because you will understand that your role as an American journalist is essential to the history of this country. Essential. You know, people, I've been interviewed, Jacqueline, by several Latina journalists. It's kind of adorable now because there are many. And they're like, no, pero de verdad, were you really the first? What was that like? And I'm like, well, to be honest with you, I was really happy I had a job, you know. But I understood that I was the first. And so with that came an understanding of my privilege. And then I was like, well, if you're privileged that you can be here, then you have a responsibility to use this privilege. And so I know how frustrating it is for young journalists. But, you know... And Futuro is small, it's growing, but it's small. But I want you to think, Futuro didn't exist 10 years ago. There will be others. Yeah, I, as far as we know, I'm the only Latina right now running a nonprofit newsroom in the United States. Um, I also didn't know that when I created Futuro. So understand that there are going to be other opportunities. You know, if you want to work in a mainstream, like in the New York Times or the San Francisco Chronicle or the LA Times, you know, go. Um, and put in the work there and find your allies so that you can, you know, withstand it because it's not easy. But also there are other opportunities that are going to come up. Like Futuro is growing right now. 
Um, so big picture is just find your allies, find mm -hmm. the people who, who you can psh, let it all out, find a way that you, that whatever it is, meditating, working out, dancing, listening to loud music, whatever it is that helps you to come down <clears throat> and then realize that you are a part of history and that we need you desperately. So please try not, I know it's so hard, but please try not to give up. And even if you have to leave journalism and come back or leave journalism and do something else, but you still do journalism on your free time, don't give it up. We need you. Thanks, Maria. And a shout out to the audience. I know Commonwealth also has a lot of donors and philanthropists throughout California tuning in. I want to encourage you all to invest in Futuro Media. We need more Latino-led newsrooms. We need yes. more stories being told from us by us. Uh, there's just not enough. Been and before to you go to your next question, I want to actually say something about that because so Futuro Media um, is actually in the process of growing. And one of the things that we've developed, which I'm so excited about, and, and this happens because I have an amazing uh, board chair of my board who, as you know, inspired me to write the book, right? And so Deepa actually said to me, you know what, Maria, let's, let's create your own unit within Futuro. Even though I'm the founder, you know, it's like my next thing. And so we created the Futuro Unidad Hinojosa, which we call the FU, uh, El FU. Um, and what I'm doing with the FU, and this is where, in terms of philanthropy, is that we are launching, we are in the process of launching, so don't make it public because it's not exactly public, but it's going to be public soon, that kind of a thing. So, um, <laughs> an investigative unit that I'm going to run and create because guess what, Jacqueline? There is no, no place that has a consistent investigative unit that is looking at stories uh, that need to be uncovered specifically for the Latino, Latina community. Como es eso? Not even Univision, not even Telemundo have consistent investigative to create an investigative unit that is specifically uncovering stories of systematic and structural abuse of Latinos and Latinas and immigrants in the United States of America. We, the, the tip of the iceberg is the horrors. So when you ask that question, how much worse can it get? It's the already, I'm sorry to say, there is no way that we can prove that an infant, a toddler, who doesn't even speak English, how are they going to talk about the fact that they're being sexually assaulted in an immigrant detention cage? That's happening right now. Women are being raped right now. People are being fed food with maggots right now because that's how the private prison industry makes money, is it buys expired food and it serves it to us. So um, investigative work, um, Latinos and Latinas, thank you for mentioning it because, yeah, that's my next thing. And let me tell you, I am fired up. We should be. We should be. I am. Um, we need it desperately. And we need it with um, respect and dignity um, to lift up those voices with integrity. Um, again, it's one of the things I found myself crying a lot throughout the pages of your book. But one of the things that kept coming back to was the humanness that you kept bringing um, up with the stories that you shared. Um, I'm going to weave in another part. I, wa I want to hear you saying it to the audience right now, but there was a moment um, where uh, you were questioned in terms of your Latino agenda you were bringing to the newsroom, but the story to Walter Conkright, like he, he, they, you were told he's not going to read that, but you push, you push, Maria, you push. That's what also, and when you said this, you, you made it clear, you're not pushing for yourself. You're pushing for everyone else who's going to come up behind you so we can keep pushing forward. Tell us the story. <laughs> I, I, I really loved writing this because I had never put it on paper. So the story goes that I end up working at CBS. Um, you know, my father was finally happy that I had a network job, you know, even though I had told him, I don't know how long I'm going to stay because, you know, getting into a network is good, but I also write about the golden handcuffs. So, you know, if you, if you start working in one of these places, it's gonna, it might be hard to leave because you're making money and you know money is a nice thing to have, but it may mean that you don't necessarily 
do the best journalism necessarily. Anyway, so I was working at CBS News and I was working in the fill-in and they asked me to produce Walter Cronkite's end of the year, <clears throat> end of the year commentary. It was the year 1987 and he would do where we are. That was the Walter Cronkite end of the year way to keep him connected to CBS because he had already retired. And so as a producer, I had to write his commentary. And I really suffered through this because of my imposter syndrome. I was like, oh my God, how am I going to, I mean, I was I just like, I was suffering through this. And I wrote, you know, a lot, a lot of drafts by hand. I remember writing it by hand on that long legal pad and then going back. And I, I worked really hard because I wanted to be sure that I wasn't coming off as the angry Latina, that I had to be a good journalist and know that Walter Cronkite was going to read this. And so I had to internalize Walter Cronkite. And that's when I was like, I'm a good writer and I can try to do that, but I will never see the world through his eyes. And that's okay. I'm not a lesser journalist because of that. Anyway, so the story goes, I write this commentary and my boss says, now nah, Walter will never read this. It was really taking on um, the government because Oliver North, you know, was like a convicted liar at that point. I guess he had already been charged. Anyway, corruption galore in the United States of America uh, with the Contras and uh, all, all of that stuff under the Reagan administration. Um, so I said, well, I think he'll read it. And he said, nah, it's too much you. And I, I thought he was gonna do this. And I guess I had kind of thought like, if this happens. And so I said, well, let's go downstairs to the fishbowl, which is where they produce the CBS Evening News. Even today, it's called the fishbowl because um, it's all glass offices around the anchor desk. And I, we went down there. He said, okay. And he handed it. I said, don't tell him who wrote it. Just give it to one of the senior editors. See what he says. And he went down there. He handed it to him. He read it. I mean, it was short. It was, you know, he read it. And he was like, yeah, this is good. Just change that word. It's great. And it was that moment where I was like, stop gaslighting yourself. You are good enough. You are, you are good enough. And I did feel like I had to take one for the team. And I felt like, you know, Norman Morris, that story involves Norman Morris. He was such a champion of mine. And then in this moment, he let me down. And I was like, I'm not going to let you down. I'm going to prove to you that the reason why you hired me is because I am good. Mm -hmm. I'm good at what I do. It's not just because I'm Latina. It's because I'm good. But as you know, with the book, Jacqueline, there was a lot of imposter syndrome um, that followed me up until not too recently, but now imposter syndrome. <laughs> That's right. I hope every <laughs> young person listening in right now hears that you are enough. Your voice matters. Don't just keep using it. You know, Maria, the other thing that you talk about in the book, um, you mentioned it briefly, but it's important because here in California, um, Prop 187, 25 years ago, last year, we celebrated that anniversary, had ripple effects in, in our country. Um, Prop 209 happened around the same time. It was part of this trifecta of this anti-immigrant uh, set of policies that were trying to hush us, push us out, um, criminalize us. Um, and this year, Californians have an opportunity to actually reverse it with Prop 16, this, uh, the ban on, uh, so 209 ban on affirmative action, Prop 16 to reverse that. Um, any insight on how the outcome of that might affect the rest of our country? So I don't think this is in the book, but what happened um, in California with Prop 187, um, it had ripple effects all the way to my house. My house at that point, my family was still in Chicago. My mother and my sister became American citizens. They're based in Chicago because of what was happening with Governor Pete Wilson and, and, and California. Other than that, I don't think that they would have become citizens. That's the kind of ripple effect that that had. And as you know, the ripple effect also is that it created a slew of Latino and Latina activists who have become empowered and own their power. You know, they were the precursors to Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, right? Um, so, you know, I mean, it, can you imagine California, like, putting forward a Prop 187 now? It's like, are you kidding? Like, that would be, like, the silliest thing. And by the way, sorry, it's New York. Um, you know, I want to remind people that 
my early years of journalism here in New York City were, were covering racially motivated hate crimes in New York City. Mm -hmm. So New York, where we, you know, really try to all get along, and I think we're doing a pretty darn good job considering we just took down the, the, the pandemic, <clears throat> this one city, um, you know, that's what was happening here. So if you think of New York and California now, it's like, pfft, that was old stuff. And we're so past that. So what happens in California is going to have a huge impact in the rest of the country. I mean, if that happens, if, uh, you know, affirmative action is reinstated, it's going to be another pleito, right? But the point is, is that it's going to, we're having a moment of reckoning right now. One of my staffers said something like, you know, this, this third iteration of Black Lives Matter, I was like, no, mamita, <laughs> not third iteration of Black, Black Lives Matter began the day the first Black enslaved person arrived here, and it has been consistent throughout, right? right? Um, and the anti-immigrant sentiment that we deal with is built on anti-Indigenous hatred, anti-Black hatred, anti-immigrant hatred. We need to make those connections. Um, yeah. Thank you, Maria. And again, I, the, the questions are coming in, and I know we have 20 minutes for Q&A, but this question in particular ties to your last point, and I want to bring it up. It's from Crystal from YouTube. Any advice for a first-gen Latina trying to have a conversation with her Mexican parents about anti-Blackness? Mm. We just got to have it. Just got to have that conversation. Um, you know, I don't, it's kind of like, I don't even know where to begin, but, you know, if we can talk, if you can talk to your parents about, um, you know, what happened in Mexico. So what happened in Mexico was that Mexico, the country was very forward thinking, right? Um, in the mid 1800s, they had a caste system that was all about caste based on race. And then in 1865, when Benito Juarez is elected president, the first indigenous president. So you can use that as an entry. You know, let's talk about anti-indigenous hate in Mexico. Why, why, why is it so hard to accept our indigenous selves? And yet Mexico did elect Benito Juarez, who, by the way, his most famous saying is el derecho, el respeto al derecho ajeno es la paz, which is respect for other people's rights brings everybody peace. So brilliant Benito Juarez, indigenous man. Mexico then got rid of the caste. Y todo mundo became Mexican. Black, white, lo que sea, you were all Mexican and then there was no black or white. That's a beautiful thing, but it erased the fact that there were many, many, many black Mexicans. And so therefore we didn't have a way to talk about Afro-Mexicanos. We didn't have the language because they had didn't want to talk about the issue of race, which in many ways was kind of progressive. So if we can talk about our own families, like I immediately think of, oh my God, when I had the moment, my revelation, growing up in a black community, hearing anti-black statements from my family, mi abuelita, then just kind of thinking about this and you know, looking one day at my uncle and I'm just like, espérate un segundo, mi tío Nicolás, he looks black. Oye, mi, mi tía Carmelita, what's up with her, you know, ni, 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 the hair? Mi tía Licha, what's up with the, you know, the facial marking? You know, so that's why I was like, can you talk about the Olmecas and the, the Cabeza Olmeca, yeah. which if you see is a black Mexican. That maybe you can say, you know, we have to understand that it actually is part of us. In Mexico se habla de la tercera raíz. And then if you can say, if you can talk about the history of racism in this country, right? Why do you have racism against black people? Well, because they were brought here in chains and there had to be a way to, to make them feel less than. That's all part of the narrative. We don't wanna participate in a narrative that makes a human being less than, right? And so if you're able to make those connections and then maybe move to, you understand the way people talk about black people is the way they talk about us. Mm -hmm. No queremos eso. Mm -hmm. Yo le decía a mi papá, my dad, you know, who had issues around um, internalized homophobia, not a, not, you know, not a surprise. And I would say, papi, 
don't use that word, papi. There are members of our family who are gay. Papi, por favor, try not. And, you know, in some ways, it's just like, like old words that they just can't get at. Mm -hmm. So with patience and love, mostly, if possible, is how I would have those conversations. And like you said, we just need to have it. That's where you started. And so wherever we started, we just got to open our mouth and, and be the ones to initiate those conversations because I mean, my dad is black Dominican, mom is white Dominican. Like it's painful that we don't talk about this and center our own pain from the anti-blackness in our own community. So thank you, Maria, for saying that. And thank you, Raquel, for asking that question. Um, I'm gonna come back to my set of questions because I have this time and I have the prerogative to come back to this. <laughs> but Maria, I'll see you. You're gonna come to Washington Heights soon enough. We'll be going. I listen, what, I, I was just we'll, there two weeks ago. Oh my just, God. <laughs> you would have to... We would have to go to El Sala Reina del Chicharron. Yes, I went there three times while I was there, mask and all, waiting my 10 minutes outside to get my Libra de Chicharrones. <laughs> okay, people who don't know, I didn't know about Elsa until like 10 years ago. But And then, you know, I really cannot, should not be eating pork. But let me tell you something. Mm, I can just smell it right now. Oh my God, there's nothing like it. Oh my God. Okay, no. All right, so that's what we're going to do. We're going to get some chicharrones and there then we're going to go. get a cafecito someplace. <laughs> Um, and actually, you might be answering this question for me right now, but Maria, you dedicate your book to Ceci, to your papi, to Maritere. Um, and you say, because you taught me, they taught you to find joy in every moment. I just love that. And I actually reflected on that because I actually have lost um, recently two family members um, in my family. I actually was in the DR right before I came back um, from New York. It was New York DR now here. Um, and it's been hard to just kind of find those moments of joy. And I'm a woman of faith, so I keep coming back to scripture and, and feeding my spirit. Um, but can you tell us what, what how you're finding joy in this moment in honor of Ceci and Papi and Maritere? Well, I wish I would turn my, I'm not gonna turn my camera because it would just be, but I, I have an altar for Ceci right here um, next to my bed. She's with me at all times. Um, I mean, it's because of her that I forced myself to find joy. Um, it really was Ceci when um, the sickness was, had now spread to her brain. Um, and the person who was helping me to understand her illness was Dr. Raul, Dr. Alfredo Quinones Hinojosa. You may know him. He was a former undocumented immigrant in California who then became a neurosurgeon at Harvard um, and now heads neurosurgery at... Um, I can't remember the name of the hospital, but anyway, he was helping me to understand what was happening to Cecilia. It had spread to her brain um, and I was in the hospital room with her and she just said, it's good, you know, we have to find joy. All of the rest of the stuff, it doesn't matter. You know, she was a competitive journalist, like her husband is a competitive journalist. And, you know, anxiety is our middle name in this country, right? We're really, we're really connected to our anxiety. And I just remember those words when she just said that, like, that's, that's what I want you to do. We knew that she was going to not have much longer. Um, and she just said, please find the joy. And so I focus a lot on that. It's very easy for me to focus on the negative. It is because I feel it very closely because, you know, my phone is here. I'm getting phone calls from refugees, from people who are stuck in Mexico, from people who are in prison. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm all of that lives on my phone. And so I feel it very, very deeply. But, you know, I'm a survivor of COVID. Um, and so every day when I wake up and I'm like, oh, OK, I, I can breathe. My husband is OK. We're healthy. Oh, my God. Let me go out and walk in the park. Thank God I have a park right here in Harlem next to me. And I connect to nature. And I find joy in that. I connect to the birds. There was a, a blue jay, a big ass blue jay that came on my windowsill here in Harlem um, on the fire escape because we have urban nature here. And so those, you know, that to me is a moment of joy. I'm like, oh my God, Cecilia sent the blue jay. I do. I'm like, oh my God, Sissy, are you, because birds, as you know, we believe birds carry spirit. So I find joy when I'm, you know, I exercise every morning with a group of people in the park right here. I exercise outside. And so I'm looking up and I'm like, I'm seeing the sky and I'm like, damn, you're out here. You're alive. You're looking at the sky. I swear. I mean, it's, 
I believe you. I see it, you it, doing that. It's kind of sad in some ways that we have been reduced to finding joy in that most basic way because we feel so attacked at every place. And yet that is what we have to do. And that is what our ancestors did. And so, yeah, I'm all about trying to find that joy however I can for Ceci and, and now for me and for my family. Thank you, Maria. Um, when I was there in New York, I went up to the cloisters and I had these encounters with these hummingbirds and I felt the same way. I felt like it was God just reminding me that, you know, hope and joy continue. It's just part of the journey. We can. Especially hummingbirds. Those are the birds that actually, that is, that is the myth that hummingbirds bring spirit. So just saying. No. Just a reminder, right? Um, so ah, the, era, era tu, viste? Gracias. Era tu gente, era tu gente que te estaban viniendo a, a visitar. Gracias, I hope you, yeah. you take it like that, yeah. Well, that and chicharrones, right? That kept me uh, joyful in between the tears and the mourning and the grief that was so real. Um, all right, so I'm getting my signals that I have to um, answer some of this Q&A questions. Um, so this is from Peter. Any advice to both parties on how to improve their reach uh, to varied Latinx for their votes? Mm. Both parties? <laughs> well, the Republican Party is going to have a lot of work to do. I don't really know how they're going to repair this. Um, you know, the fact that let's say 25% of Latinos and Latinas support Donald Trump and this Republican party is cause for concern, but I'm not really sure that you can grow it much beyond that. And so I don't know how you kind of recuperate and rebuild a party that is built on hatred and anti-immigrant and anti-Latino sentiment. I'm really not sure what's going to happen. I, I mean, I'm really watching um, the Lincoln project, all, all of the former Republicans that have now formed the Lincoln project. Um, like what, what will those Republicans do? Because they're now all like supporting Democrats. So I'm like, because we need a Republican party. We, we, we need that, mm -hmm. we need that friction. Mm -hmm. um, the Democratic party, uh, time is running out. Um, you know, I, I have said this publicly um, all over the place. You really cannot win huge and big unless you have massive Latino and Latina voter support. So the fact that Democratic Party is not, I mean, I don't know, Jacqueline, if you know about um, elections, I don't know in, in Dominicana because it's been a while, but in Puerto Rico, do you know about the elections in Puerto Rico, what that's like? Yeah. Oh my God, it's a party. Yeah. So the the elections in Puerto Rico involve caravanas, caravans. With, with, with bocinas. Yes. With speakers that are as big, <laughs> that are as big as my room. Yes. Okay. Speakers that will blow your head off. Yes. And the speakers have jingles for each of the candidates. And I'm. They're like, merengues and salsa. Like, when <laughs> is the Democratic Party here in the United States yeah. going to figure out contra? Yeah. Just get the caravanas, get those flags going, going through the community. I mean, like. Right. How is it that I, I'm not a political activist? How is it that I can figure that out and they yeah. can't? So it's- um, They haven't gotten to know us. They don't listen. They don't see us. <laughs> but we need to be seen, but- So it's very frustrating. But, you know, um, I also believe that uh, Latinos and Latinas understand these policies very closely because nos, nos impactan en carne propia. Mm -hmm. And so we'll see. But I, I have no, I'm, uh, this is a very tight election. So Maria, the other question related to this one, I'm gonna go back to the top, is from Raquel. She's saying, you know, some Gen Z Latinos are feeling really disillusioned at our political system, specifically because they don't wanna vote for either Biden or Trump. What do you have to say to them? Um, I don't know who it was that said it so beautifully because I've just seen so many things. Uh, somebody super, super, super progressive, maybe this person, won't, but basically they were like, uh, maybe it was Angela Davis. Was it Angela Davis? It was somebody super political who basically was like, yeah, Biden's got problems all over the place. I'm voting for him. There's no doubt about it. Um, I mean, at this point with Pobrecita Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who also was not perfect, but okay. Uh, with her gone, this is some very scary stuff. Um, the possibility of Donald Trump being able to name even more people to the Supreme Court is would be a, a real uh, real life horror for us. I'm going to tell you something that someone close to me said I won't reveal, but but maybe this will be a reason why Latinos and Latinas should 
absolutely get to the polls and vote no matter what. And I feel, I feel the disrespect. I mean, Bernie Sanders would not have won were it not for Latino and Latina voters. We showed up and then it was kind of like, eh, thank you, next. But this person said to me this morning, you know, I think I better make the appointment at the gynecologist. And I was like, okay, why? For your annual checkup? And she said, no, given what's happening in the country with the Supreme Court, I think maybe I should get my IUD now in case Donald Trump gets reelected. Mm. There's a reason why I stopped watching The Handmaid's Tale. I could not. I could not continue because it was too close to home. And so we are at that point. We are at that point. Um, you know, I, I'm going to make a joke now because it's getting really deep here. So I like to make jokes because, you know, got to laugh. So I'm five things that this president doesn't like, which is why if he gets reelected, it's going to be real challenging because I am these five things. So I am Mexican. I'm an immigrant. <laughs> I'm a journalist. I'm a woman. And I'm flat chested. <laughs> I know you guys are like, what? What did she say? Pues sí. Entonces, I, I can say that. I can say that because it's my body. You can't say that. But I joke. But the truth is, is that, you know, we couldn't imagine four years of Donald Trump. It, it was a very scary moment. And, and look what we have. Forced hysterectomies. Children who are in cages, ripped apart from their parents. Muslims being banned from this country. Trans people being banned. Puerto Rican people being insulted by having paper towels thrown at them. And a kind of bullying and also, I mean, Donald Trump is, um, he's the product of a, of, a, of a psychopathic father. So I did read Mar uh, Mary Trump's book. He's also not very smart. And we all see this. He cannot get the basic names of states right. So, ¿qué es esto? That we're giving him this level of respect of the president of the United States when he can't even say the name of a state? ¿Qué es eso? Or the name of a place? Or, I mean, so the deference that we, um, that media gives to him, it needs to stop. He's, this is an authoritarian regime that we're living in. And so that is a reason. Maybe not to get enthusiastic, but let me tell you this. What we did learn after the enthusiasm of getting Barack Obama elected, um, and I was in, in the book, it's right there in the book. I was like, I was not, a because I'm not, I'm not a, I'm not on a political train. You know, I'm not like, yay, he won, it's all good. Um, we have learned now that no matter what happens, it is up to all of us to hold them accountable, period. It's not like, oh, he won, it's all good. Oh, it's a black man, yes. No, democracy doesn't stop. Activism doesn't stop. Demands don't stop because of that. The accountability. You know, one thing you just said right now that um, reminded me of what someone shared with me a long time ago, that racism is not just that we, systemic racism, we lift the bar for people of color, but we also lower the bar <laughs> for people who are not people of color, right? And we've yeah. lowered the bar so much for what it means to be the president of the United States. I mean, last night I was texting some of my cousins, like, here's the president of the United States talking about throwing tuna cans and talking about Goya and the same co incoherent sentences the president of the United States of America. Like how have we reached this point? But we digress and we're not gonna give that any more room or space right now. I'm gonna go back to a question from the audience. Do you feel immigrant communities are forced to share their trauma publicly in order to be humanized in white America? And do you think the cost is worth it? And I'm gonna make that the last question, Maria. That's a very deep question right now to be asking. Um, this is really hard. Um, you know, it's, it's what my life's work is based on. Um, in some ways, yes. Um, and we have to be very careful about this. They understand this. I mean, this is, this is part of the horror uh, uh, of their own lives. Um, you know, the thing is, is that while this president is busy saying that we are coming to this country to destroy it, take it over in these caravans. What people don't understand is the people who are, who are getting here are the survivors. 
they are the ones who are like the most, you know, the ones that have the most will to live. We should be learning from them. We should be learning from them. So I do worry, um, you know, I would actually point you to listen to the recent reporting we did um, from Mississippi on Latino USA. Um, this was in the place where they just went through the largest uh, immigration raid, the poultry plants. Remember, it happened just days after the El Paso massacre. It was like, hi, you were massacred just now because you're Latino and Mexican. Now we're going to go and, and detain and arrest people who are going to work in a chicken plant. Um, and what we, again, what people need to understand is that the people who are rushing to get here running is because they have experienced trauma. And so we at Latino USA, in this particular story, I think we handled it well. We went deep into one person's story, um, a, a, a refugee from Guatemala who is undocumented. And we really, we really thought about this at Latino USA because we don't want to be participants in trauma porn. Hmm. Um, that's what, what we call it, right? But at the same time, I do feel that it's important for people to understand the level of, <clears throat> in this case, dehumanization of women refugees that led them to come here. The impunity that they live through in Honduras or El Salvador or Guatemala that forced them to come here. So I, um, I'm very cautious about this, but to be honest with you, all of the people who I mentioned on the phone, who I'm like in touch with and waiting to hear from, all of them have experienced levels of trauma that, I mean, I'm just gonna leave you with, leave you with one horrific image, which actually was in our reporting of, um, the Moving Border series, which also I would recommend you listen to, but um, you know, a hunter and mom who takes her daughter after they had been kidnapped and escaped from the kidnappers in Juarez, then they get to a government shelter. So like already, and one morning they wake up and the little girl is completely naked in a government run shelter. So um, people need to hear that. They need to hear that. That is a mom who is now forever traumatized that this happened to her daughter who she was trying to protect. So um, here's what I hope a girl can dream. I've said it publicly in terms of Biden. I'm like, you know what? This would have been the perfect opportunity for you to say you're going to shut all these places down and that you're going to begin an immediate reunification of families. And what I want to see is unlimited mental health for all of those people. Yes, yes. Unlimited free mental yeah. health yeah. for all of those, with people specialized in trauma. And we exist. There are many Latinos and Latinas and other young people who are working in the field of social work, clinical social work, psychology, psychi psychiatry, psychiatry. Um, we, need, we need that. Thank you, Maria. Um, by the way, to Californians, Governor Newsom has an opportunity to shut down these attention camps right here in California, and we need to lead by example. Enough with trying to cut corners about shutting them down. Um, they don't belong in this state. They don't belong in this country. They don't belong anywhere in the world. Exactly. And they're, and they're not centers. To your point, you said this. I'm not going to give it the name center and clean it up. It's a camp. And it's a place where horrible things are happening to children right the second. And, and you um, know what? There was a conversation about people saying, you know, um, should, we, should we make them better, right? Should we make them better? Is that part of it or the shutdown? And I think at this point, um, you need to shut them down. This, these, are, these, are, these are concentration camps. These are places that will be written about in the history books in 20, 25 years from now. And they'll be like, what were you thinking? And so many Latinos and Latinas are working in these places. We need them to become whistleblowers and to help shut these places down. And to all our pro-life folks, Christian religious leaders, like pro-life, like there are children, infants right now sleeping in cement floors in these camps. Um, like we need them to hear this loud and clear and call it out for what it is. 
Um, and on the mental health piece, Maria, thank you for embedding that throughout your book, for speaking so openly and vulnerably about your own work. I was going through my grief counseling myself these last couple of weeks. It's been a while since I actually talked to someone about everything because the pit was dark and I didn't know how I was going to get out of it. And I just want to acknowledge that during the time that we've been together, three things have happened. Um, your phone music was I will survive. It was a tone to I will survive that was coming on. So I'm not going to let that pass because my goodness, like so much of what your book is also about is about survivor, but not with that victim. It's just, yeah, like head up, shoulders back. Like I may be going through it right now as we speak, but I'm going to get through this, right? The other thing that happened were the sirens, the sense of the urgency of this moment right now. Like, yeah, New York City, there's loud noise, but it's a reminder that there are people that are being picked up by an ambulance right now because they are dying. And they're dying because there have been systems set up that have locked people out from healthcare, that have been sick before COVID, it's gotten worse. So this is not new, but we got to fix these problems with a sense of urgency. And then the last thing was when your light was going to come down and you called in man and I thought how beautiful and poetic, right? Like some of us feel like the light is going to fall down, dim down, break apart, blow up. And sometimes we just got to call for reinforcements and call that person closest to us to hope is held it up. Dude, break and it down. Mic drop. Boom. Whoa. <laughs> This moves me though, Maria, as I feel like, you know, none of that was a coincidence and I want to blend that all into just what happened right now. And we're getting near the end and I want to give you enough time to answer the question that Inform has traditionally closed these, uh, those, uh, oh, forms. Barking dog. Oh. <laughs> I love it. Hi, Walter. <laughs> um, the question is, what's your sec 60 second idea, Maria, to change the world? My 60 second idea to change the world. You know, when I, when I first heard that, I was like, how do we get everybody to love each other? Mm. How do we do like one big love fest? How do we, that, that's, you know, and I know it's like, oh, how mushy, how mushy, you know, but in a way we, we have to, I really, and I didn't watch all of Star Wars. Like I saw one, you know, but it definitely feels like Darth Vader versus whoever is the light in Star Wars. Right. And, um, and so it's like, we just got to win with this capacity for love. Yes. But also, you know, Dolores Huerta, who is in California, as you know, um, always talks about people power. Mm -hmm. You know, she's like the most, um, the, the least powerful people in California changed everything by becoming organized with the United Farm Workers, right? And they changed everything. And so Dolores always goes back to people power. And when you think about what we saw with people power on the streets, so it's like love and people power, yeah. love and people power. Those two things, however we can harness it and also not giving up, we're not going anywhere. Right. Where am I going? <laughs> I'm not going anywhere. So, um, so doing that with the people who are around you and also globally, we can do that now in this world. And I really love being with you. Thank you so much, Jacqueline. That was like, so good. <laughs> that was, nobody else has made those connections to things happen. All at the same time, it wasn't in just one thing that so many things happened, the siren, the light, the dog, the this. So you're right. There was something special that happened right here. And I'm really, really happy to have shared it with you and everybody at Commonwealth. Ditto, ditto, Maria. To have you 3,000 miles away, feeling like you're still with us right this second is really special. And um, with your people power and the love quote, that just made me think about um, Martin Luther King. And I just, it's one of my favorite quotes when he said, power without love is reckless and abusive and love without power is sentimental and anemic. Love at its best is love implemented. It's just a reminder. They go hand in hand. And, you know, at the Latino Community Foundation, I don't know how much you know about us, but our mission is to unleash the civic and economic power of our people. Um, because we know that when Latinos thrive, our economy, our democracy, and love that's embedded into the culture, the DNA of who we are, will win at the end of the day. So, Maria, I wish I can hug you. I'm sending you a virtual hug right now. I love, love, love your book. For all those out there, it is available now in your nearest bookstore. You can order it online. I actually highly recommend also the Audible version. You <laughs> tell the story with so much love and passion. And I love hearing you talk Dominican and Cuban and Mexican dialects. I'm just like, my husband's Cuban. I'm just like, you got to hear her talk about 
Oh, Roguano. Yes, yes. I love how your tone just changes. It was beautiful, Maria. Thank you for this gift. Thank you so Thank much. You just at the right time. Sending you Thank so you much so love much. California. Much love to everybody. I hope to see you soon. Take Adios. care. Take care.